Good morning and welcome to this meeting of the Indiana Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council. My name is Chris Goff. I serve as an Associate Justice of the Indiana Supreme Court and I've been designated by Chief Justice Loretta Rush to serve as Chair of JRAC. Later in the agenda, uh, members of JRAC will be given an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves and to provide a brief report on any work or news that might be of benefit to JRAC. The first item for consideration this morning is approval of the February 26, 2021 meeting minutes. Prior to today's meeting, a copy of those minutes was circulated to all JRAC members. Uh, if members have had an opportunity to review the minutes and if there are no questions or concerns, I would entertain a motion to approve uh, the minutes from the February 26th meeting. I'll make a motion to approve those minutes. Second. Thank you. We have a, a motion and a second. Our motion was from Amber Finnegan. Was there a, a I'm sorry, I didn't identify the second. Alien. Okay. Hello, Senator. Thank you. Uh, so we have a motion and a second. Is there uh, any further discussion? Very well. Call for the question. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I thank you. Motion carries. The minutes will stand approved. Um, next, uh, I'm going to go through a legislative update. And uh, the first uh, item to update is uh, House Bill 1068, which is the Local Justice Reinvestment Advisory Councils. So uh, House Enrolled Act 1068 was signed by Governor Holcomb on April 8th, 2021. Uh, most provisions of the bill are effective July 1st, 2021. And a copy of the Enrolled Act was included in today's uh, materials that again were circulated to all JRAC members. Uh, for purposes of today's meeting, the bill has two key provisions that I would like to discuss today, and, and those are as follows. First, Section 6 uh, calls for a review of Community Corrections Code provisions, and this section was effective upon passage. So uh, included uh, is the statutory language directing JRAC's review. Today's meeting materials, uh, again, included a copy of that language, which uh, states as follows. The Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council established by Indiana Code 3338-9.52 shall conduct a review of community corrections code provisions in the Indiana Code and make recommendations to improve operations with evidence-based practices. The Justice Reinvestment Advisory Council shall submit a final report containing its findings to the Department of Correction not later than December 1, 2021. The report to the Department of Correction must be in an electronic format under Indiana Code 514-6C. Um, I'm going to uh, participate in that work group. I think that this is important work uh, for JRAC and uh, at this time, I would like to solicit uh, participation from other JRAC members to undertake um, this uh, statutorily defined duty for JRAC. Um, are there any members who would like to volunteer to participate? Well, clearly Justice Golf, uh, Department of Correction would like to be a part of it. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you, Chris. Yeah. yeah. And Justice um, Goff, I would be happy to participate as well. Thank you, Doug. Good morning. Morning. Justice Goff, this is Troy Hatfield from Popeye. I'd be willing to participate. And I, I do have a question, if I may. Sure. Um, do you know if this review would also include a review of the administrative code under uh, Title 210? There are a few things under that that pertains to community corrections, like uh, the application for the funding, fund distribution and disbursement, and things like that. And I'm not sure if that would be included in that review, but I thought I'd point that out. Sure. Yeah, I think it's something worth discussing. Mary Kay, are you uh, prepared to speak to that for Troy? 
Uh, not at this moment, Justice Goff. I think that's a great question. I think that we, we um, here at Court Services can research that and work with DOC, uh, start that conversation, and then update the work group at its first meeting on that, or in or prior to the first meeting, with our recommendation. Thank you. And Justice Goff, this is Kirsten Haney from SBA. I'll participate in that work group too. Thank you, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. This is Amber Finnegan from the. Indiana Association of Community Correction at Counties. I would like to participate as well. Um, and if I could also just reiterate, I think that it is really important to have some, I know not necessarily members of JRAC, but if there could be some contingency people on this committee review committee too, um, from season directors, um, I think this is a really important and <laughs> a big issue for just one community corrections director to have representation on. So I would just like um, like you to consider maybe appointing a few other seasoned directors that their experience and their history of, of this could be very valuable to this committee to review as well. I think that's a great suggestion, Amber. Um, I've uh, got some uh, folks that I thought would, would certainly be indispensable. And in, in my experience working collaboratively, uh, I always end up leaving people off my uh, initial stab at, at the list. But uh, I, I thank everybody who's spoken up so far. Obviously, Chris uh, is going to be crucial to the uh, endeavor in her role at the Department of Corrections. I thank Amber for speaking up, Troy for speaking up, uh, Bernice. Um, I, I was waiting. Uh, I'm interested to participate as well. Thank you, Justice. Thank you. And Chris? Hi, Justice. Yes, thanks for asking. I'm happy to participate as well. Great. Um, and uh, Steve, we have your participation as well, or, or Sheriff Clark, but somebody certainly from ISA? Yeah, I think we could find a sheriff probably that does run community corrections. Most of the sheriffs don't. Uh, 102 may have a work release center, but for the most part, majority, they're just on the local community corrections board. Uh, but most certainly we could find a sheriff that fits that role. Okay. And uh, Jay, are you on the phone to, uh, on the call today? Yeah, I'm here. Um, would you also be willing to participate in our discussion or, yeah, or, of course. or designate someone to? Great. Thank you. And then... Uh, Judge Spitzer is unable to join us today um, because he's, he's uh, he had not under obligation, but um, that's his misfortune because I'm certainly going to designate him to participate as well uh, as our, our representative from uh, the Judges Association. Um, and, you know, as, as Amber indicated, I, I think that this list is probably a non exhaustive one. Uh, Mary Kay, when we were uh, preparing for today's meeting, I think that you and your staff had suggested that we try to find a time for an initial meeting in the next two to three weeks. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. Okay. And can I ask then uh, you or your staff to try and uh, uh, solicit some available times from uh, those members who indicated that they would be available? And, and, and folks, everybody else on the call um, your membership uh, and your participation in this is, is most welcome. And so if I didn't identify you the first round and you would like to be uh, part of this discussion, please, uh, that's my oversight. So please uh, speak up. I, I would love to uh, hear from you. This is a, a big undertaking and we wanna make sure that we're considering um, everyone's perspective. Justice Golf, if it would be okay, I would also like to make sure that since this pertains so much to us that our, um, we have a DOC legal represent, representative on the um, committee as well. Uh, Megan Little is who we would like to represent. And of course, Kristen Bonsbach will be a part of it too. She'll, we'll be working very closely with her also as director of community corrections. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I think that'd be great, Chris. Thank you for saying so. Their, their mm -hmm. help and participation is uh, most welcome. I, anyone else? Uh, Justice Goff, I would like to participate if that's okay with you. And um, our office and our staff are certainly um, willing and capable of providing staff support for this group. How did I overlook Mary Kay? Of course, yes, thank you. And David, you're up in the corner of my screen as well. Is this something that you'd uh, you'd like to participate in or someone from your office? 
Yeah, let me see if I can find maybe a county commissioner even who has either been a community corrections, law enforcement, sheriff, something like that, who could participate. So I'll check and uh, get a name to um, April or Mary Kay. Thank you. Um, are, are there any other uh, participants? Again, certainly not a last call, but I want to make sure I identify, I identify you as early as possible if you do have an interest, because uh, we want to make sure that our team uh, gets you the invite and uh, is um, certainly uh, sensitive to your schedule. Okay, very well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Justice Golf, um, I just had a question real quick. Would this, I, since you're going to be a part of the committee, would you chair that the committee? That that was my thought. Um, I, I don't want to inject myself in it, but this was uh, such a big statutory mandate that I thought um, it, it might make sense to do it and coordinate it that way. But certainly, um, okay. There's, I'll make there's... a motion for Justice Golf to be the chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <One second. laughs> um. You know, this this is an area that I really um, I really care pretty deeply about because I, I know how important this is to um, our communities and I know how important it is to um, you know our, our justice system in whole since uh, you know 2014 or thereabouts when we had our criminal code revision. Um, you know, this is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. So it would really be an honor uh, to, to participate in this with all of you. So um, that was my thought, Chris. But that's that, that's certainly not set in stone. Oh, that works great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary Kay, am I am I missing anything else then with respect to uh, to our solicitation for members? And and again, that's open ended. As uh, Amber pointed out, I, I I think we might spend some time that first meeting trying to identify any omitted stakeholders. Um, and, yes, and Justice Scott. Oh, I'm sorry. No, please go ahead. Um, I think uh, to the extent that other members have um, other outside groups or not outside groups, but maybe local uh, stakeholders that they would like to, to include, um, certainly send that information to April and we will include them. Um, as you can imagine, scheduling with a large number of people is challenging. So I think we will likely um, give priority in scheduling to the membership um, but we'll do the best that we can to accommodate any of the other stakeholders um, uh, schedules as well as we, as we put that together. Thank you. Thank you, Mary uh, Kay. Just to, just to Scott from Mary Kay, one quick question. Is it, is it your thought that this will, um, this will uh, uh, process will look a little bit like the jail overcrowding task force? Uh, maybe not with such the public hearings, but um, since we can easily do those virtually, but kind of kind of that same where we where we um, allow for input to the group and yeah, um, Doug, you know that's a great question. And to, to be honest with you, I had not given um, it as much thought as that in in terms of shaping this to look something like the jail overcrowding task force. That. Um, I, I, but but I will tell you that I'm I'm certainly um, open and, and would welcome the opportunity to afford uh, folks you know the chance to make public uh, to have public input. But um, perhaps that's something that we need to uh, to settle on and hash out during the first couple of meetings. We've got till the end of the year, I suppose, to make our report. Um, we're coming out of the restrictions, obviously, with COVID and those concerns. And as you mentioned, we've got the capability to do things remotely, but I'd not given that much thought. I apologize. I think it's a great idea, though, to uh, to afford those public input opportunities, and I think that we'll get a better product if we're hearing from more people, but perhaps we need to put some thought into how to how best to manage that. Well, and that might be a, a way to help manage um, or, or get input from community corrections without, um, without having all of um, the community corrections directors at the table as well. I think that's excellent. Um, so Mary Kay, when uh, you and your folks are uh, working with me to schedule that first meeting, let's let's spend some time coming up with some options um, as, as Doug suggests to maybe manage um, the work and the input from uh, members so we can hear from everybody that's uh, volunteering to be uh, part of the group itself. 
but then also able to give uh, maximum opportunity for all of their uh, stakeholder groups to also have uh, input. Justice Goff, if, if it's, a, if it's um, okay with you, um, perhaps we could have members um, send to April any ideas or thoughts that they think would be good topics for discussion. Um, I know that our office has spoken with Kristen and Chris from DOC, and I think they have uh, kind of a, a scope of review, so to speak, that they would like to see discussed, but I would imagine that there are others um, that members uh, may identify. And, and maybe if we have that in advance, we can, you know, internally we can sort through some of those and that could help us plan maybe a first agenda as the group sets priorities. Sure, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, what I'd like to do is in our uh, solicitation or our, our inquiry, if we send out a, a poll or something, let's go ahead and uh, make sure that we're, we're doing that in writing. We're asking for um, any agenda items from member participants. And then when we um, get a date ironed out with everyone, we'll add that as a formal agenda item. And I expect that that'll be a significant part of our discussion during the first meeting. Thank you, Mary Kay. Thank you, Doug, for bringing that up. Um, if, uh, if we've got our, our bases covered on the, uh, the, the, the work group and uh, planning for our initial meeting, I'd like to move on to the next agenda item which is training and technical assistant for local JRACs. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to announce that Doug Hunsinger through Governor Holcomb's office has provided the Indiana Office of Court Services with funds to support training and technical assistance for local JRACs. Um, I'm going to uh, ask the EBDM work group formed at our last meeting to identify some short and long-term opportunities for the state council to support training and technical assistance for local JRACs and report its recommendations to the council at our next meeting on June 4th. So I, I really appreciate and wanna express publicly JRACs appreciation to Doug and Governor Holcomb uh, for their willingness to support this endeavor, which I, I believe is going to be a very successful state and local partnership. Mary Kay, am I missing anything else uh, with respect to our local JRAC? Um, no, the only thing that I would add, Justice Goff, about the training and technical assistance is um, you know, we have, you know, in the past, as part of the evidence-based decision-making initiative, we had a professional development group. Um, so we've had you know, JRAC members um, and or evidence-based decision-making team members who've been dedicated to Kind of getting out information to our various stakeholders about EBDM um, and the great work we can do. Uh, we've also uh, made some attempts on our office with assistance from our other partners to do some local work to try to replicate that which was provided to us by the National Institute of Corrections and the Center for Effective Public Policy. Um, we have made contact with Mimi Carter um, and she is willing to provide us some assistance. So I think that's something that we would really like for um, the smaller uh, JRAC group that's already working with Mimi on the initiative that they're going to update on in a moment um, to talk about what she what support she can provide to us and then what we may be able to do in-house. So I think that's just for members to know that that's kind of what we were thinking. Um, I've talked to, with Doug about that as well and I think that meets um, the expectations of the governor's office on the funding. So hopefully uh, we can work something out with Mimi. Great. Uh, do any members have any questions for Mary Kay uh, or uh, about the technical assistance? Well, thank you. Um, are there any other uh, items, legislative items of interest that uh, <clears throat> need to be reported out or, or that uh, members would like to report out to the group on? This is Bernice. Um, I wanted to just celebrate the success of 1199. Uh, that was the traffic um, bill that we was the product of a great deal of collaboration between so many agencies. Certainly IPAC led the work with Chris Daniels, who was really great. Um, we participated, B BMB, Department of Insurance, like I could go on. And so it's really great that we were able to come together, do something collaborative that will result in a lot of good for the people of Indiana and help 
bring relief, get people lawfully back on the road uh, and able to, to work and, and take care of their families and themselves. So just wanted to point that out. That is a big victory. Thank you, Bernice. And thank you, Chris, and uh, everyone who was involved in that significant legislation. Um, what a testament to collaboration. Yeah, thank you, Bernice, uh, for your partnership and every, everyone, virtually everyone on the call. And I know Chair McNamara and Senator Italian were both uh, uh, on the bill and appreciate that support. And as we move forward with implementation, I see opportunities for some joint training because, uh, you know, the courts, uh, judges who have the high volume traffic courts, this will be an adjustment. And uh, so we're, we're now geared towards uh, uh, implementation and training. And, and again, thanks for all the partnerships uh, on this bill. Great. Um. Yeah, I would like to just um, talk about two. Uh, the juvenile justice bill passed, uh, and I think that's on the way to the governor. That's that's uh, good. Wendy and I worked real hard to get all of the people, uh, get all of their issues worked out. Um, FSSA still has one little thing that they came to me on the very last day and I said, next year. Um, but uh, then I, I have to say that I'm sorry that 1202, which is the sentencing amelioration bill did not pass, um, but I guess we try that again next year. Well, Senator, um, thank you very much for that report out. And I'm, I'm told that you have not surprisingly, some uh, great demands on your time today. And so if there is anything else that you'd like to report out on, ma'am, I, I wanna give you that opportunity. And I, I also wanna say publicly how very much I appreciate uh, your dedication and service to JRAC over this, this past year, you've been uh, such an instrumental part of our discussions. And I, I really appreciate your willingness to attend and collaborate with all of these justice stakeholders. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's uh, well, Wendy knows it's tough to get, like, come down after session and get all the rest of your life back together. So uh, I'm afraid I have a few of those today. <laughs> okay, great. I just want to no, please. E echo what they've brought up. It, for me, it was an exceptionally busy session. <laughs> I had a lot of bills to go through. Um, certainly the the driving while suspended bill was probably uh, one of the most monumental um, and, and Senator Italian's work on the juvenile uh, competency work was was excellent. Um, some things you haven't mentioned is the um, in the budget, there's two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars for CSG to go forward and study juvenile. Um, reform, juvenile justice reform. So we're going to have that funded. They'll be doing an in-depth study um, for the next year, six months probably, um, on juvenile justice code across the state of Indiana and do a deeper dive. So happy that that was able to, to get in the budget and be covered. And for DOC, um, another request is stab vest for uh, corrections workers uh, so that they can have the opportunity to be protected while they're in, in DOC. Um, probably my biggest disappointment is 1202. Um, that bill would have would have brought parity um, and probably my biggest frustration. With all the successes that I had this year on all the bills that I had, most definitely that one's the the one that that will hurt the most and and stick with me the longest and um, we'll see what happens again next year with it, uh, because of just the collaborative group that was brought together, um, to work on that bill, you probably won't see in any other type of legislation ever. So, um, look forward to continuing that fight next year. Um, Representative and, McNamara, oh, oh, go ahead, please send her. No, I was just going to say Wendy's absolutely right about that. And of course, uh, I didn't say anything about the budget either, but um, there, the, we had a good year for criminal justice reform. We really did. Um, we got a lot of significant bills through. Um, and um, uh, the other thing I want to say, we also had a good year for the budget. Historical 
historical vote on the budget yesterday um, was nearly unanimous between Dems and, and Republicans. Um, and a lot of programs uh, got that had been cut, got their money back, uh, were, you know, had full funding restored. There's extra money in the budget for a lot of things. Um, so in balance for the criminal justice system, I think that uh, it was a good year. Well, thank you again, Senator and, um, and Representative McNamara. If I could just also express my appreciation to you on behalf of my colleagues and uh, everyone um, that's participating in JRAC. It was just so helpful this year to have uh, your input and to have Senator Talion's input uh, so informative to our deliberations to understand the constraints within which you work and um, to work uh, together with you to uh, make things better, uh, safer, and, and more equitable for, um, for Hoosiers. So thank you for your dedicated service. And it's, uh, it's really been an honor to serve with both of you. Thank you. Are Thank there any you. other items uh, related to the legislative session that members would like to report out on before I move on to the next agenda item? Uh, yes, Justice Goff, this is Devin. Uh, Devin? Two, uh, two quick points. So one, I know I don't know um, to Representative McNamara's point with the, the budget about the CSG study. So I don't know if people are aware, but I know the uh, preliminary assessment that CSG did on the juvenile justice system was released very recently. So just bring that to folks' attention. It's publicly available. Um, I've got a copy if anybody wants to see it. Um, but also um, in line with the budget bill, um, I wanted to, to talk about, so uh, CJI received in the budget bill $7 million over the biennium for uh, law enforcement training grants. Um, how that's to be administered is a little loose and there is a limitation on how much funding we can grant to an to a law enforcement agency based on the amount of funds that they recovered or received um, through handgun licensing applications. Um, so there, there is a little bit of a disparity based on between small agencies and large agencies on that. But one of the things that I, I would like would be um, to maybe solicit from the group um, maybe some, some uh, areas in particular with uh, um, now that JRAC's combined with EBDM uh, and we've also got the race and equity group uh, as part of JRAC, um, particular thoughts. Cause I know, you know, early on with EBDM, we studied touch points with the system starting with arrest moving forward. Um, so folks um, I'd like to maybe, and, and I'll reach out to probably some individuals uh, directly, but maybe some thoughts and some guidance because we really don't have much on what that money can be geared towards. So I know much of the membership sits on the CJI board, so they'll obviously have some influence, but um, we'd really like to put some, some thought and some um, perspective behind this on how we administer those grants and not just administer training for, you know, um, random, random topics, so to speak, or stuff that would not uh, types of trainings that would not be um, maybe super beneficial to the state as a whole. You know, Derek, I, uh, um, Devin, Devin, I have one thought uh, in particular that comes to mind since you bring that up is that um, we had made a presentation, many members of the, the call last week to um, just about every trial court judge in the state. Um, the subject matter was improving court and community res response to uh, mental health and co-occurring disorders. And uh, I just, I'd ask that you might touch base, um, follow up and circle back with either Mary Kay or I, and perhaps Steve or uh, Sheriff Clark um, uh, about uh, maybe some interest in that. Um, Ber Bernice, Chris, Doug, and, and Jay have been part of those conversations as well, but um, th there, there might be some uh, opportunities to leverage uh, some of those dollars and, and uh, and really go a long way. We're, we're, we're in the initial stages of planning a statewide summit, much like the opioid summit and the pretrial reform summit for the fall of next year. And um, you, you, might, you might have some opportunities to really have uh, many people telling officers the same thing at the same time, so. Okay, 
Great, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Devin, uh, go ahead, go ahead and reach out to me too. As I, um, there, there's a few. We have a few initiatives that I think might might fit. Just if you want to just brainstorm with us. So. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Thanks, Jay. And uh, Justice Goff, this is Derek Mason. I would speak up as well. Um, <clears throat> while we still have Senator Italian Representative McNamara with us, uh, and we're talking about budget items. So obviously in our section, we were going to report out the success that we actually did have with the budget. And I want to thank JRAC for endorsing the importance of the reimbursement that the commission provides to counties for public defense in exchange for standards and the importance that um, our, us maintaining our financial needs to provide that full 40% reimbursement. We were able, uh, I know Representative McNamara championed that early on, uh, as well as uh, a lot of different legislators, including Senator Italian that are on here. And we were able to secure the $2.9 million that we needed to be able to avoid prorating our reimbursements to our counties. Um, but then in addition, kind of a last minute, uh, change, we also received, and I know the council will talk, I'm sure about it some as well, but we received, the, the commission essentially is going to be receiving $2 million extra a year for at-risk youth and families. And one of the things that we also want to do, uh, that was a very recent change, is reach out and let people know that if you have ideas on what we should be doing with that $2 million as well, uh, which is per year, so $4 million over the biennium, uh, related to at-risk youth and families, we would certainly be open to conversations between now and and uh, the summer when that money starts flowing in on July 1st. So I uh, just wanted to thank Senator Italian for the that real valiant effort to get us that extra $2 million per year. I believe the council's also getting, um, and like Bernice will let her talk about it, $500,000 more per year for the same thing for training um, and work that she does with public defenders and her agency. So uh, this is really exciting uh, to be able to have these funds and really pilot some uh, really potentially awesome things as it relates to at-risk youth and families in the next biennium. Thank you for that, Derek. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you're participating in this group. I, I know um, how, how much your help means to uh, counties as they try and bring themselves in compliance with standards and, and what those monies mean to uh, quality of justice throughout the state. Thank you. Happy. Justice Galt, this is Dave Bodor for the Association of Counties. Just one other thing in the budget I want to put on people's radar is um, late in the session, there was some language appeared about how opioid settlement money will be distributed. And um, we're, uh, I think most of that looks like it's going to go to FSSA, but I think this, uh, this group would have an interest in um, working with FSSA on, on programs um, you know, to benefit mental health addiction services and things like that. So uh, really haven't had a chance to evaluate the, the language exactly yet, but um, it's just, a, again, a, another additional resource um, to help us with the uh, opioid and mental health issues. And, and because it doesn't have any federal strings tied to it, hopefully um, we can come up with programs where it's used either in the jail or pretrial or, or post-incarceration to, um, make sure we can continue uh, with services um, around people who are sentenced based on based on opioid addiction or, or mental health issues. So. Yeah, Dave, I, I really appreciate your bringing that up. And um, I so appreciate your participation in our uh, stakeholder conversations throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, your ability to sort of identify uh, these funding sources that are, you know, for lack of a better word, unusual. Uh, has been very helpful to us as we try and plan for them. And uh, just share with you, we've had discussions among my colleagues about uh, really going, uh, uh, trying to dedicate some folks for that particular purpose to make sure that uh, any dollars that are coming in are identified and uh, able to be put where they're most needed. So I, I appreciate your input and uh, please, please keep it coming. That's, that's very good to know. Um, anyone else? 
I would like to say um, I, the the sequential intercept map that we you know that mo the locals were were um, you know gone through this training and everything. Um, the big thing when you're talking Devin about like training and and that is you know law enforcement is key and who even gets into the criminal justice system. And I just think like if if we could just provide training and more options for our law enforcement so we're not putting them in jail because we don't know what else to do with them. Um, you know, it, it just, it's, it could just make such a huge impact in our criminal justice system as a whole. So when you're thinking about training dollars, I know just locally, if we could just train our officers as what, you know, I show up and, and you could just tell this person, okay, do you want to go to jail or do you want to go to treatment? And then actually have places where they can go to treatment, you know, just, just how big of an impact um, we could we could intercept those and provide those services way before they even get in the criminal justice system in the first place. And, and so I just I just get excited about that because I've never really looked at it, you know, from that standpoint, um, mm -hmm. since before we did that, that sim training, which I thought was really was really great. So and to, to piggyback off that, I mean, you know, it's great synergy here because our plan over the next few years with this sort of new influx of money is is to work on the, the places for them to go right and so whether that's regional crisis centers or or, or, or or you know things like that and so there could be a very nice kind of synergy if Devin's group could provide kind of best practice training to law enforcement and we work on more providing the places for them to go um, that those those two things could work very well together so look forward to those conversations me too. I was going to jump in on this section as well. I was going to wait till we got called up. But to Devin's point, I think some training regarding CIT statewide would make a big impact. A lot of the big counties can do it. The big cities can do it. But it's difficult because it's a forced 40-hour course to get some of the smaller agencies even to send an officer. So if we could help backfill overtime or come up with maybe a different curriculum format or something that would allow more of those officers to get that training, I think it would lend itself well. And, and then even trying to get Indiana on board with things like the Stepping Up Initiative, as we work towards um, our mental health summit, I think would help as well. And then we also need to think about something that's targeting our jail officers. CIT is an awesome model for street officers and it's aimed at that dynamic, but it's, it's a little more difficult nuance for the actual folks who work in corrections and in the jails. And they are frontline seeing some of those mental health folks. We've done something called mental uh, health first aid for all of our jail employees, but I think there's some attention and love needed in that regard that Steve and I and some others have been working on to try to make a program maybe like Texas has done, where we have certified officers in working in the jail that aren't necessarily police, but are trained in signs and symptoms and alternatives for the folks who are in our custody. Okay, yeah, something we may do, and, and thank you all for the, the discussion, I appreciate it. So related to this, we may actually just kind of develop a bit of a, I'll use a survey for lack of a better term, to send out and maybe gauge some interest in, in areas. Obviously, we may kind of narrow down priorities a little bit, say mental health training or substance abuse or something like that to kind of guide. Um, but I, I definitely foresee us doing maybe something like that so we can gauge some priorities. Because you know we have three and a half million dollars each year over the biennium, but three and a half million dollars over 600 different law enforcement agencies doesn't go very far. You know, and to tie the conversation together, it started with Amber, um, you know, talking about how valuable the sequential intercept model training was to communities. And so I just want to share the reason I'd wanted you to reach out, uh, Devin, to, uh, you know, Sheriff Clark or Mary Kay in particular is we've been doing some work that took a backseat to the pandemic, but uh, Mary Kay has actually been working with the National Center for State Courts uh, to map uh, our mental health delivery system in Indiana. And um, we're going to have some deliverables available to our stakeholders soon, but we hope that that tool will allow our communities to really understand where different uh, choke points are in the delivery system and where resources need to be allocated. That's going to also help, uh, you know, the legislative partners and, and the executive to really prioritize where resources need to be placed. So uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's complicated, but I think it's really the right way to approach this. And I'm very excited as we emerge from the pandemic where we're gonna be able to really kind of step in and um, pick up on some of this work. The summit that we talked about is really gonna be composed of hopefully 92 uh, county teams, multidisciplinary teams that are gonna come down and, 
and, and really uh, hear the same message at the same time and be able to tailor uh, a, a response that fits the needs of their, of their community. So I, I think it'll be of some benefit to you, Devin, as you try and figure out where these dollars can be most, uh, most helpful. Great, thank you again. Thank you. Um, well, this was a busy session as, as uh, our, our legislative partners indicated, a successful session for, for criminal justice reform. I, I don't wanna cut this conversation short, but I, I, um, we've got another, uh, some more items on the agenda, but our, our last call, are there any other, uh, any other items to report out on from the legislative session? Justice Goff, um, Steve Lewis with the ISA. I would just add um, maybe information for Devin on the law enforcement training grants. Um, the ILEA training board, they did send a report over to the governor's office uh, probably a year and a half ago on some deficiencies, some areas they need to be improved on. Uh, all law enforcement is represented on that board, so it might be a good start also. And I would probably, from the conversation I'm hearing and over the years I've been involved in around 20 years, uh, it took a while, but the silos are down. And I, I, I can't tell you to see everybody on the same sheet of music more than ever is such a great thing here in Indiana. And uh, to David's discussion on the opioid and his approach, I think a regional approach with a lot of this and continue investing into our infrastructures like we're doing now. Um, it's not going to be uh, a one and done. It's going to take a lot of hard work in several years, but I think that's, I think we've got the right recipe. We need to just commit to doing and, and go down the road we're going. I agree, Steve. Thank you for that. That's a, a very good starting point for, for Devin as well. So thank you. In, any other report outs members? Trying to click my ribbon, uh, maybe for the last time for a while. Uh, <clears throat> all right, um, well, item four on our agenda is uh, the National Institute of Corrections, EBDM and state and local jurisdiction update. And during our last meeting in February, uh, you'll recall Mimi Carter, uh, principal for the Center for Effective Public Policy provided information on current EBDM projects supported by the National Institute of Corrections. Uh, volunteers formed a JRAC EBDM work group to continue these discussions with Mimi and to serve as the lead for advancing EBDM's strategic plan under JRAC's direction. And at this time, I'd like to ask Angie Hensley to provide an update from this work group. Hello, Angie. Hi, thank you, Justice Goff. Um, so upon a, uh, approval of the work group, EBDM formed again, um, like we used to kind of, all the people that volunteered. Uh, we met on March 23rd. Um, this group has been tasked with identifying people to interview um, and to add their personal reflections and experiences that they've had with EBDM um, in the history of that in order to develop a case study that uh, Mimi Carter is working on with NIC to be able to help figure out what could help other sites, um, you know, sustain a business model like this with a large jurisdiction. So um, we are in the process of identifying uh, people to be interviewed that have contributed to EBDM with their personal reflections and experiences over the um, last 10, well, it's been a long time. We're starting with a Grant County um, endeavor back in 2010-ish, um, 11. So um, the team has also um, been tasked to look at centralizing kind of some of the pertinent documents that were created by the state team's efforts. Uh, the work group will serve as reviewers for the monograph that's created as a result of those uh, looking at the milestones, the timeline um, of EBDM um, events and documents created, and we'll give feedback on that. We're also looking to have anyone that was interviewed by uh, Mimi's team or her to review the monograph as well and provide feedback before it's published. Um, the other part is if we have enough time, because we're trying, I think she's trying to wrap up interviews by um, May, maybe end of April to May. 
and the documents should be all uploaded this week. Members of the team should be getting an email from Cindy McCoy or uh, Mimi Carter to review the documents and see what else we might need to add or you know, take away or what might not help. And then um, I think the timeline for this project is to be wrapped up by the end of June. If there's enough time, she's, we're still looking at the possibility of being able to present a national webinar on Indiana's uh, efforts and case studies. So uh, we will be um, looking to reconvene and kind of go through that list and participate through email um, discussion or on the team site that we've created for this purpose. So. Well, great, uh, Angie, thank you for that, uh, for that report and that update. Um, are there any questions for Angie from members before uh, we, we move on in the agenda? I'm not hearing any. So uh, Angie, thank you again for your update. Thank you for stepping in in, in a pinch. I know that uh, this is something that you'd not planned on presenting and we look forward to uh, seeing the deliverables from your work group and, and thank you for your, your work. Uh, so we appreciate it. Thank you, Justice Scott. Um, the next item on the agenda, I'm going to ask for a report out from uh, the JRAC Racial Equity Work Group and uh, reporting out on behalf of the group uh, are Bernice Corley and Steve Luce. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Justice. So as Justice indicated, uh, I and Steve Luce co-chair uh, this work group. Uh, this work group has had two uh, meetings of the full group. Uh, starting with the first meeting, um, and let me back up and say the uh, the group is very well represented by entities here, so uh, I won't be real redundant, but in our first meeting, all of the state agencies represented, we basically went through an inventory of what agencies have what data that can be looked at by race. So it was a very productive meeting because we wanted to understand what data do we already have and begin to imagine what questions can be answered with the data we have. You know, we don't want to you know, recreate the wheel or make a burdensome request. We want to work with what we already have. So it was a really uh, helpful inventory to understand what we had and what was where and what was tracked. And maybe also identifying some weaknesses that we have in our data collection and, and what might be helpful to have. In our second meeting, we had a really great presentation from uh, DOC, uh, Sarah Shelley presented on um, just, we, she started with the funnel of criminal justice, you know, starting with arrest and looking at how somebody might matric, how someone matriculates through the criminal justice system. And then how at each point, um, unconscious bias can enter through decisions made at different points and how, um, to be effective uh, in terms of bringing equity or, or ending disparity is understanding where un unconscious bias can come into play and disrupting that bias so that we have more equitable outcomes. So uh, there was a lot of discussion. She didn't even get a chance to complete her presentation. So we'll have a follow-up meeting uh, to go back and, and have her complete it, but it was a really good discussion. Um, the first area that we looked at in the funnel was arrest and she shared um, some national trends uh, with respect to um, race and arrest. And there is uh, data available at uh, the state level here in Indiana. Uh, MPH has some great dashboards that are publicly available if someone is interested to, to look at it. Um, so we're pretty good um, with arrest da data at the state level. The next level of the funnel of, uh, that Sarah presented on was uh, prosecution and those decisions. And that area was, was less congealed, uh, less easily ascertainable. Uh, so that is an area where this group thought, well, let's pause here and get an understanding we, we understand national trends, but we don't know Indiana's trends. So we thought it would be good to get a picture of what do Indiana stats look like at this point? So that's kind of where we're pausing and uh, going through the funnel. We're pausing there and, and trying to understand where data is, gathering that data, and then being able to understand Indiana's practices as a state um, with respect to prosecutorial decisions. So that's uh, where we are at this point. Um, we are also, this group is collecting a lot of data, a lot of reports. And we don't want those things to be lost and we want them to be usable 
reviewable by the work group and certainly by JRAC as a whole. Um, so we have been working with court services staff to try to figure out um, a way to hallmark these materials so that you know anybody who wants to say, hey, there was an article that was mentioned in the meeting, I wanna go back and, and see that. Uh, we'll have a place where everybody can go and look at it and we don't lose the knowledge we're gaining or the materials that we're compiling. Uh, Steve, do you have anything? You're muted, Steve. Yeah, I, I would agree with um, Bernie. She's done a good job in leading a group, and most of the conversation has centered around data. Um, and you know, later on, I'll, re I'll, I'll report an update on the jail data transformation project. But and I, I'm just going to be honest with everybody too, with everybody on here. Um, the group when we meet discussions. I mean, this is still a sensitive and a hard topic to talk about for everyone. So I just want you to understand when when we're asking for answers, it's kind of silent at times. But you know, the, the point is we got to talk about it and we got to bring this out and we got to see where we can in change and do better things with our criminal justice system and 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 do better trainings and and really try and have solutions for the people who are questioning the the, the uh, whether it's law enforcement or criminal justice system, but um, I would give credit to everybody on the calls. Um, they're moving along. And, you know, I think when we're all said and done, because Bernice's approach has been great, uh, I think we'll have some really good reporting for us. Steve raises a great point. And we, pro we probably haven't solidified it in this group, but at least from my perspective, we won't know as a state we're successful if we don't start with data. We, we have to understand where we are and identify goals. And then we'll only know success when we look at data. So that's why we have started with data as a conversation and understanding where we are. So we won't know that we've done well if we don't move or change markers. So thanks, Steve. Uh, Bernice and Steve, thank you both for your leadership in, uh, in this discussion. I, I know this was, I think the first item that was brought up uh, when I, um, showed up last year uh, to start serving as chair. And um, this is a difficult discussion as you indicated, but the, the, the progress that you've made on behalf of uh, Indiana's justice system already is I think commendable. And I think that we're uh, all very excited to see where this conversation leads. Uh, so thank you very much for your, your service and your willingness to lead in this important area. Are there any uh, questions from JRAC members before we move on to uh, our last agenda item before report outs? Any questions? Um, Justice Goff, I have a couple of thoughts for uh, Bernice and Steve's consideration. Um, in the recent past, we've had a couple of counties reach out to our office um, requesting some grant funds to look at some of their um, race and equity issues in their criminal justice system, which includes um, pulling some data, uh, but also one of the counties uh, proposed to work with Dr. Evan Lauder um, and Dr. Lauder put together a beautiful proposal for this county um, on looking at race equity issues in their criminal justice system. And as you can imagine, um, Dr. Lauder is the, is the researcher who is at George Mason who does all of our pretrial research. She's very interested in this. She put together a great proposal um, that I think you know, to kind of spark some questions um, about how we can go about providing support to counties who really want to look at this. And certainly collecting the data and reporting the data is a piece of it, but we need the analysis to go along with that. Um, so, uh, and Dave and Lisa, uh, Dave Williams and Lisa Thompson, who are fantastic, everyone who knows them knows that. Um, they actually asked Evan if she would help us um, through some other conversations we're having within our office in OJA to really try to um, frame some of the data that we are able to generate through Odyssey and our insight applications. Um, and some of this may have come up, Bernice, as you were talking with Mary Depri. Um, but Evan has agreed to sit down and talk about, hey, what kind of information do we have? What, what, how can we use it? How do we frame some of these questions? So Bernice and Steve, if that would be helpful to this group, I think, I think Evan would be more than happy to you know, somewhat consult with you. And if it's something that we needed to um, retain her services for a longer period of time or a little bit more in depth, we could talk about our ability to do that under our existing projects. Um, and she's really eager and excited to, to get in those conversations and help us. 
That's wonderful. Um, yes, Mary Kay, uh, Steve and I will follow up with you and try to figure out how to incorporate that because we want all these trains to be moving in the same direction and, and helping one another. So that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I think one of the things we've talked about is, is once counties are able to identify um, or identify the data sources and even um, go beyond description and a little bit of interpretation of that data, then what do they do? Then what do we do from a policy perspective? How do we provide training and support and resources uh, to be able to maybe change some of the trends that we're seeing um, within a community? And so you know, Evan is, is kind of prepared to, to walk that journey with us if, if we're willing to have her do that. That would be wonderful. Yep, we'll follow up with you. As always, Mary Kay, thank you for that excellent input. Um, anything else for Steve or Bernice? Uh, this is Derek Mason um, with the commission again. I would just offer Dr. Liddell's services to the group as well. Um, you know, we have the benefit of having a, a doctoral level statistician on staff and the extent of, you know, being able to access resources or utilize him. I think he'd be happy to um, participate in that group. Derek, Derek will definitely take you up on that. <laughs> Thank you. That's wonderful. Anyone else? Well, again, uh, Bernice and Steve, thank you very much for your uh, for your service, and uh, it's great and uh, exciting to hear your your report. And uh, look forward to good things to come. Um, and Mary Kay, can I ask you uh, to please give a, a report out um, on uh, JRAC data sharing and a need to update our uh, our MOU with member agencies? Yes, thank you, Justice Goff. Um, in your media materials is a copy of a memorandum of understanding that was signed between uh, key members of stake, uh, key stakeholder members of JRAC and the Evidence-Based Decision-Making Initiative, um, primarily documenting the partnership and a willingness to share data among those agencies um, and in working with Criminal Justice Institute and MPH um, as kind of the brokers of the data uh, that, that could be of use to advance uh, JRAC and, and EBDM's initiatives. Obviously, since we are now uh, a, a one group of JRAC and EBDM and we've added new membership, um, it's appropriate for us to revisit that. Um, and I think as we are kind of re-engaging, um, I think, you know, especially when we're looking at um, some of the work that Steve and um, Bernice's group are doing, you know, this renewed um, commitment to data and data sharing, I think it's timely um, that we revisit this. So our staff, We'll work on revising this and updating this memorandum, and then we will circulate it to, to agencies um, soliciting their willingness um, to sign on to the MOU. Thank you, Mary Kay. Uh, do any JRAC members have questions for Mary Kay before I uh, move on to report outs? So hearing none, uh, we've now reached that point in our meeting where I'm going to ask for report outs from all of our uh, member agencies. And so as I go through uh, our list of member agencies as set out in uh, the JRAC statute, uh, I'd ask uh, that you please introduce yourself in case members of the public are viewing and uh, then and, uh, give your report out on behalf of your agency. And uh, the first report out, I'm going to call on uh, Troy Hatfield from Monroe County on behalf of the Probation Office's uh, Professional Association of Indiana. Troy. Thank you, Justice Goff. Again, I'm Troy Hatfield. I'm a Deputy Chief Probation Officer in Monroe County, Indiana. I'm the current president of Popeye. Um, and uh, just a few things. Uh, back in mid-March, we completed a new Chief's uh, Probation Officer Orientation Management Institute and a Chief Probation Officer Summit. And despite the challenges of it being virtual, uh, we had a lot of positive feedback regarding the sessions and the, va the value of our event. We also recently surveyed our chiefs about our upcoming fall conference and ske uh, that's scheduled in French Lick in September to see whether we should kind of move forward in planning an in-person in event. And our preliminary results from that survey indicate that most people want to be in person and they're really eager to see each other again um, and uh, get involved. Uh, but we'll be making that decision soon at our, our, uh, our May board meeting. Board meeting. Um, next week during the Justice Services Conference, uh, we'll be awarding our annual scholarship in honor of Donald Charlie Nepple. 
um, who's a probation officer in Allen County who was killed in the line of duty in 1997. Um, he's a, he was a probation officer for 12 years and a veteran of the United States Army and Air National Guard Reservist. Um, that scholarship is awarded to a Popeye member who is pursuing an advanced degree while working as a probation officer. And where we're looking forward to um, honoring Charlie and uh, uh, giving out that scholarship again this year. And the last thing I uh, wanted to say is Adam McQueen is normally here um, representing Popeye at the JRAC meetings, um, but he recently stepped down as president of Popeye after four years. Um, at the helm of the association, and we really want to thank him for his many years of service as president, um, as well as the other positions he's held on the board. Fortunately for us, he'll remain on the board as our past president, and he'll continue providing us a lot of valuable input and uh, help with mentoring uh, us and the other members of the board. But uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to report out. Troy, thank you for that update. Uh, thank you for your service, and congratulations on your election as the new president. Uh, just also uh, echo uh, your thanks to Adam for his leadership uh, and his service to the cause of justice in Indiana. So thank you for that. Uh, do members have any questions for Troy before I ask for the next report out? Very well. Uh, I, I then next ask for a report out from Kirsten Haney on behalf of the State Budget Agency. Yeah, thanks, Justice Goff. Um, so obviously big piece is legislative session being wrapped up for the time being and the budget being passed. So for SBA, that wraps up about 10 months of work that we've had going on for a while. So the next task is we have about 45 days to put together the as passed budget. Um, it's pretty much a book of appropriations, everything that the fiscal impacts of this last session. Um, and beyond that, we are going to be working with agencies that had federally appropriated dollars, just because we know with federal dollars, it's usually no strings attached, um, or it's not no strings attached, sorry, correct me. Um, so working on, you know, uniform reporting requirements, what that's going to look like internally and making sure we can definitely be prepared to pass an audit. And then the last piece is fiscal closeout, uh, which we begin over the next two months, so we'll be heavily working with agencies as well. Uh, but that kind of wraps up all of the updates from SBA. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, are there any member uh, members who have questions for Kirsten before I ask for the next call out, uh, report out, excuse me. Well, Kirsten, uh, thank you on behalf of JRAC for uh, keeping us so well informed uh, this year on the, on the budget uh, process. Uh, next, uh, ask for a report out from David Botwer on behalf of the Association of Indiana Counties. Again, uh, thank you, Judge Goff. David Botwer, Executive Director of the Association of Indiana Counties. Uh, again, appreciate being a, a part of this 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 group. Um, we're having our first. Uh, we have district meetings that started May, where we go out and discuss what happened at the state house and we are having live events and of course we'll follow all county health department protocols but it'll be our first time we'll really start talking about house bill 1068 with our members and the need to create the, the local jracks um, the other thing that we're working on is um, many of you know the american rescue plan act was passed and so um, indiana counties uh, received $1.3 billion. Um, we'll get our first installment of that before May 10th. Uh, so half of that will come in by May 10th. And um, many of you probably have learned about it through your organizations, but um, uh, we're waiting for U.S. Treasury guidance to come out to tell us exactly uh, what all is eligible for expenditures. We know things like broadband are eligible, water and sewer projects. Also replacement money. So anybody who lost money due to the pandemic, and I think I've talked to some people on this uh, on this call about backfilling funds that did that would normally have received uh, court fees. Obviously, the court fees didn't happen; weren't collected much last year. So there is an opportunity to backfill those funds that would have received those fees. We do have to have a conversation with the state. I think about. Um, what funds they're going to backfill and which ones may um, come fall on the counties. But uh, it's great to have this opportunity um, to spend this money. And, and, you know, what I just tell our people is uh, 
all the money under the current law has to be spent by the end of the calendar year 2024. In the 2025, we want to look back and say Indiana spent this money better than anybody else in the country and that it really was a transformational opportunity. So that's our overall objective for this money. And I certainly hope that counties will reach out to um, your members in the counties and ask for their input on how this money uh, could be spent to really transform the county and, and improve uh, local justice, mental health, um, addiction services and things like that. So it's a great opportunity. We're, we're still learning. I've talked to Bernice about what we can do um, to make sure that um, public defenders know that this money is available and how it may be able to be spent uh, to help them as well. So great opportunity. We've had one class on this already. Um, we put it out on our YouTube page video uh, with the State Board of Accounts. But as soon as Treasury guidance comes out, we'll have a better understanding of all the eligible expenses. But all I have, and if anybody has any questions or wants information on ARP that we've collected through our National Association or through State Board of Accounts, be happy to share it with the group. Thank you, David. Uh, again, are there any questions from uh, JRAC members? Well, David, I again, just want to publicly thank you for your service uh, and your, your willingness to keep us informed about this very uh, important uh, development that's going to affect uh, all of us and, and, and hopefully so many of us in a positive way. Um, I would ordinarily call next on uh, Judge Mark Spitzer of the Grant Circuit Court to provide a report out on behalf of the Indiana Judges Association. Uh, Judge Spitzer was unable to join us today. Uh, he did report to me, however, that there was nothing uh, significant to report on behalf of the, the Indiana Judges Association. So I thank him for uh, his service to the judiciary and to JRAC. I would next uh, ask for a report out uh, from Derek Mason on behalf of the Public Defender Commission. Yes, uh, thank you, Justice Goff. This is uh, again, Derek with the Public Defender Commission. Uh, the only thing I would just reiterate again is that we do have the additional $2 million for at-risk youth and families over the next um, year and then another 2 million. So 4 million again total over the next biennium. I bring it up again because over the next few months, we need to figure out exactly what our goals are going to be with that money as it relates to public defense and at-risk youth and families. And so for I am on the Child Welfare Improvement Committee. Uh, I'm sure we'll be discussing that, um, which is also led by the Supreme Court, but uh, we are open to uh, other people's ideas. Uh, we are going to be having our own meetings. Uh, and then in June is our commission meeting where we'll be discussing uh, what ideas that the commission wants us to actually pursue. So between now and the middle of June, if anyone has any particular ideas, which we've already gotten some emails from different agencies, um, please uh, reach out to us as soon as possible. That'd be great. Thank you, Derek. Uh, do any members have any questions for Derek before the next report out? Well, again, Derek, thank you for your service. And uh, we look forward to working with you in the months to come. Of course. Um, earlier in the meeting, we did hear a report out from Senator Talion on behalf of the Senate Corrections and Criminal Law Committee. Uh, is there anything further? And uh, also in the um, earlier in the meeting, we heard a report out from Representative McNamara on behalf of the House Court and Criminal Code Committee. Uh, is there anything further to report out? Sure, just a couple of things I don't think that were mentioned. Um, and probably the biggest one is House Bill 1006 with uh, the major um, collaboration there on law enforcement officers. And then um, the uh, high tech crimes unit um, really making an investment in trying to address uh, high uh, address crimes in a high tech way. Um, it'll be centered around Indianapolis to begin with, but expand across the state. And um, another one would be the mental health and addic addiction forensic treatment. Um, all of those were uh, Greg Steerwald's bills that came through and um, really transformational bills that have come through. Um, but other than that, um, 
I think we covered everything. And um, like Senator Talion said, it was a good year for criminal justice in the state of Indiana. Well, thank you again, Representative McNamara, uh, and thank you for your service and your willingness to uh, collaborate with us here on, uh, on JRAC. Um, are there any questions for Representative McNamara? I'd next then ask for a report out uh, from Doug Hunsinger on behalf of the Office of Governor Holcomb. Well, thank you, uh, Justice Goff. I'm Doug Hunsinger, the Executive Director for Drug Prevention, Treatment, and Enforcement. Um, I, I don't have um, a whole lot. We have obviously been spending um, a, a lot of our time on the on the legislative session, and um, want to thank Representative McNamara and Senator Italian for all their work. Um, it was a really great session uh, in, as it relates to um, substance abuse and mental health. Uh, uh, so. Uh, can't say enough uh, for their support, not just for the additional $100 million that was in the budget, but for the restoration uh, of the um, funds uh, that go to mental health and addiction. Um, and, then, and then also that five-year extension for our syringe service programs, uh, which is so important for those existing programs to continue to operate. Um, we are working with uh, uh, our our state agency partners. Uh, we've been hosting some uh, roundtables and some stakeholder discussions that will begin to inform an update to our strategic plan. Uh, also uh, in conjunction with this is obviously the influx of um, not just state funding, but federal funding uh, that we're still waiting some guidance on. So all of this is uh, kind of being rolled together uh, as we begin to look at um, what we will be able to do with all of this additional funding uh, for the uh, for the coming years. So, uh, and then throw in the uh, opioid settlement into that as well. Uh, there is a lot of work ahead in this space and um, beginning to uh, grow um, and uh, um, and supplement the infrastructure uh, that we have. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank thank you. Um, are there any questions from JRAC members for Doug? Hearing none, uh, Doug, thank you for your continued good uh, partnership and, uh, and Governor Holcomb uh, for everything that you are, are doing uh, to uh, make things better for Indiana. So appreciate that. Uh, next, ask for a report out from Bernice Corley on behalf of the Public Defender Council. Thank you, Justice. My name is Bernice Corley. I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Public Defender Council. Um, as Derek Mason alluded to earlier, uh, the council received over the biennium an additional million dollars for, as he stated, at youth, uh, at risk youth and families. Um, the council and our function certainly would hope to complement um, whatever programs that the commission creates complement it with training and supports to public defenders that represent um, youth and families uh, in DCS cases, TPR cases, CHINS cases, et cetera. So we'll see how that develops. Um, and I thank David Batwer for bringing up the CARES funds. So certainly uh, everyone on this call uh, about just about represents or supports county-based services. And so I just wanna encourage all of us um, to support our county-based services and make sure that they are equipped to advocate for them, themselves and the services they provide to uh, access care funds. I mean, certainly from the public defense side, there are funds that public defense services are, can access that are fed by court fees. And certainly those court fees were down, you know, when, when cases, less cases were being, um, you know, matriculated through the, uh, through criminal justice system. So just using that as an example, I just uh, would ask all of us to be mindful of how we can support our counterparts in the county and make sure that they're able to provide their best services and get the funding they need. Um, apart from that, I don't have any other update. Uh, Chris uh, Naylor also alluded to, um, we definitely want to develop some trainings to coordinate around 1199 to be sure that we can implement, that is implemented effectively and reaches the most people. So we'll definitely be having conversations with different counterparts around putting together training on that. Thank you, Bernice. Uh, JRAC members, are there any questions? Hearing none, Bernice, uh, thank you again for your, your dedicated service and uh, 
look forward to seeing what develops from all of these things that you've reported out on. Thank you. Uh, I next call for a report out from Chris Naylor on behalf of the Indiana Prosecuting Attorneys Council. Thanks, uh, Justin Scott. This is Chris Naylor from IPAC, and uh, we are uh, getting ready for some in-person training. Very excited about that, starting with some workshops uh, next week, and uh, then lots of good training in, in May and June. And we'll be at limited capacity, but we will be in person, and our folks are, are very excited about that. I uh, appreciate Chair McNamara mentioning the high-tech crime unit bill. Uh, that is huge. Uh, appreciate the support of uh, Chair McNamara, Representative Sturwald, and the fiscal leaders. You know, we had a couple of prosecutors kind of pilot uh, these programs in, in St. Joe County and Tippecanoe. And this, you know, really will impact all violent crimes and murders just because of the extent uh, that phones are utilized in, in today's society. And so this will lead to, you know, streamlined investigations uh, and also streamlined truth in terms, it will exonerate people when you have this capability to zero in all based on search warrants from the court. You know, none of this is the surveillance stuff, uh, but some neat things that, that the current programs have done is to partner with uh, uh, higher institutions uh, of learning, such as Notre Dame and Purdue, and uh, utilizing the work of students who are, are digital natives uh, know this stuff so well. So it, it's just a really impressive program from a number of angles, and to be able to expand the scope to, to reach the state uh, is really special. So we appreciate all the support on that. Uh, the uh, uh, one something I wanted to mention, we got contacted from a colleague in another state and said, how are you guys doing with jury trials? Uh, we're, we're kind of uh, stuck. And uh, from our perception, uh, since March 1st, things are going relatively smooth. Some counties are quicker than others. Uh, but it was nice to be able to point that, that colleague to the Supreme Court's website with those COVID resources. Uh, it had been a while since I looked at it, but there is some really good stuff on there, particularly uh, dealing with jury trials and for jurors what to expect. Uh, so it was nice to be able to pass that on. Uh, and uh, I like what David Bottor said about really taking advantage of this opportunity with the funding. Uh, maybe a couple ideas. Uh, it may be a Herculean task, but uh, we've talked about it before, maybe just like a roadmap of all this funding uh, to ensure that you know efforts aren't duplicated uh, in the best use of this of this funding in this special time. Uh, and also maybe some best practices reporting out. It would be good to hear, uh, you know, really good util utilization of this funding uh, over the course of the coming uh, weeks and months. So just a couple of ideas to, to throw out there. Chris, I, I think that that's, uh, well, first of all, I appreciate all of the report outs, but uh, I think your last point is an especially good one. And, um, I don't know if you're asking for any action on behalf of JRAC in that regard, but to the extent that you might be, I just want to extend, uh, we, we want to fully cooperate in any uh, collaborative efforts, system-wide efforts to make sure that all of those bases are covered so that uh, Hoosiers have the opportunity to uh, really fully benefit from uh, this once in a lifetime uh, you know, financial package. Uh, any any questions for Chris from members of JRAC? Hey, Chris, it's Brett Clark from Hendricks County. Can you tell us what that's going to look like when you start choosing the various offices to pilot that high-tech crimes unit? I know there's a regional approach being taken. It's going to be eight or 10 more offices added to the list. What's that going to look like, just out of curiosity? Yeah, we'll be working closely with the IPEC Board of Directors in that uh, selection process. Uh, very important will be geography because we, we do want uh, access across the state. And, you know, if we can limit that drive time to an hour or so, you know, that would that would be uh, ideal. Uh, it's also one of those things you won't need to travel necessarily every day. Once you drop off a phone, it can be processed. Uh, so, you know, attention to uh, equitable distribution on geography uh, key will be, you know, do you have the ability to partner uh, with uh, a college or an Ivy Tech? Uh, and then what, you know, do you have the physical space to do that? Uh, the nice thing is we've got two offices who have a very mature program. And so, you know, the new units will be leaning on, on those two offices uh, who've got good experience. And, uh, you know, Marion County IMPD, they've got a good program as well, which, uh, you know, will incorporate and, and uh, you know, use their expertise uh, in addition. Great. Thank you. 
Um, any other questions? Well, Chris, again, uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for your great partnership uh, to, to all of our justice stakeholders. Um, I'm glad that the website was of benefit to your colleagues uh, across the country and uh, you and so many other people on the phone are, are largely responsible to the deliverables on that website. And I appreciate everything that you did and uh, the way of input during the pandemic. So thank you. Um, next call for a report out from Jay Chaudhry on behalf of the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. Uh, good morning, this is Jay Chaudhry, the Director of the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. Um, kind of keeping with the theme here, uh, DMHA is uh, going to be or is in receipt of uh, a lot of money um, from both the COVID stimulus packages and uh, the, an additional appropriation by the General Assembly from the American Rescue Plan um, for mental health grants over the next biennium, um, which obviously is in, in addition to the, the money that we already kind of control and distribute. So we're still sort of parsing out the, the specific details about a lot of this money. There's, you know, four different funding sources with different strings and different restrictions. Um, and so we are kind of building, building assist, building systems to, to make sure we're able to track and report on all that. Uh, but there's, there, we, you know, we, we hope to use a lot of this funding to uh, accomplish things that should be of interest to, to a lot of JRAC members, um, whether it's, uh, building out or strengthening our crisis system, um, you know, improving the, the there's overall uh, criminal justice interface, whether it's sequential intercept model or something else, um, improving treatment in jails and prisons. And so, uh, you know, we, we look forward to working with a lot of members um, on, uh, on these initiatives over the next couple of years. And we think that we have an opportunity to, to really transform um, a lot of the mental health and SUD uh, infrastructure and delivery system. So, uh, you know, I think we'll have some more details in the in the weeks and months to come. Great, uh, Jay. Thank you uh, so much for uh, your, your being here today. I, I know that you'd uh, it, it had it had an accident, and so uh, welcome back. And uh, we look forward to good things to come. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for Jay from members of JRAC? Great. Um, next, then call for a report out uh, on behalf of the Indiana Sheriff's Association, uh, either from Sheriff Brett Clark or uh, from Steve Luce. Okay. Um, thanks, Judge. Um, I'll go ahead. And then Brett will probably follow up with a few items. Um, we just had a, a successful spring conference downtown Indy this week. I had 59 of our uh, sheriffs at, uh, along with uh, their um, employees attend. So we uh, had a very successful conference, a lot of great topics, good discussion. Uh, it was good to see everybody. Um, I did want to report that uh, uh, the state of Indiana has awarded the victim notification statewide R RFP uh, and also the jail data transformation grant, um, which we've already met with Aaron Garner, uh, Mosier Consulting, who won that. And our sheriffs now are working to get him a direct one person contact. And my understanding is this project timeline, uh, hopefully by October, we'll have a, a jail data transformation project we've been talking about, which is great news. Um, the uh, ISA is managing the uh, state opioid grant, federal grant also. Uh, to this day, we have 20 jails that are expanding or using the money for MAT and uh, evidence jail-based treatment and other programs. Uh, three more jails have contacted me and to this date, uh, we've used over $700,000 uh, for these jails to provide that treatment and services to their, with their providers. Uh, the ISA also is partnering with uh, University of Wisconsin out of Madison, uh, Jessica Vincheski. Uh, they have a program up there, JCoin, where they're offering a two-year technical assistance and two-year research study for jails across the country. They're recruiting 
to help bring in research on opi opioid use disorders in jails and treatment programs. And they're also there to help set up their NIATEX teams and coach them and show them how to do a better job of maybe implementing. So that was real positive. And we've had some sheriffs sign up for that. Uh, another uh, program that we're working on with uh, public defenders, uh, Department of Corrections, in the State Department of Health is we're addressing the topic of pregnancy and postnatal care uh, for mothers in jail or mothers-to-be. It's a very important topic. Uh, we've had great leadership from Dr. Doss from the DOC in leading those discussions. So our goal is to provide a, a training um, presentation to our jailers and through the medical providers too. Uh, Bernice has been part of that discussion. It's been very productive, and uh, Dr. Doss is very excited about that. And I, the, other, the only other thing I have to report, and this is something to me is one of the most important things um, that I think the ISA can be involved in. We talk about mental health and um, the population, but we don't talk about it enough with the um, public safety workers, law enforcement, EMS, and fire. And I say, along with other associations in public safety, have partnered with Recovery Centers of America to create the rescue program for specifically those in public safety who are fighting mental health illness, addiction, co-occurring disorders. And happy to say they uh, opened the program last week. We announced it to the sheriffs yesterday. And I got a report that we actually had a sheriff that um, brought a patient from their department to the program. So it's, uh, they're listening. So I think this is a wonderful thing. And I don't know any other state that is doing something like this specifically for their public safety workers because they, uh, they are exposed to a lot of traumatic things over a career. And with the pandemic, I can tell you, I've gotten more calls and text messages from sheriffs over the last year looking for assistance for their employees. So I just think that's an awesome thing that's that's going on. And that's all I have to report, Sheriff Clark. I think he pretty much nailed it. We did have a great conference. We had a lot of good speakers, including our own Mary Kay Hudson, who came and spoke to us to, to close us off yesterday. A lot of good turnouts there. So that was some good discussions. As someone said, we did have a great session with the uh, legislators this year, I think. So thanks out to all of them. It's just a start. I've already worked on the sheriffs to try to be thinking about what kind of issues we want to talk about next year and to keep the momentum going, especially with stuff like 1127 and some of the partnerships that we had with Jay um, and others. In Hendricks County, we reconvened our EVDM group. I gave them a summary of House Bill 1068 and congratulated them on being our local JRAC committee. So <laughs> we're, we're getting going there. and I'm excited to keep that ball rolling as well. Um, for Mr. Bodorf, we did convince the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee to hear us out regarding um, funding, not necessarily for level six, but for holding parole violators and persons awaiting a DOC pickup. So we did get that raised to $40 on the per diem, which we talked about for many years, and that was at least a good step in the right direction. So I think, uh, Steve, great, a, a great session, but thank you for uh, letting us take part. Well, thank you both. Um, you know, I, you all are always so busy uh, and it's exciting to, to hear what you're doing because it affects uh, courts, but all of the stakeholders. But I, you know, Steve, I'm especially excited to hear uh, about uh, the way in which you all are taking care of your own uh, and, and what a tremendous need to meet. So thank you for that. I think that that's, uh, that's gonna help a lot of people and that's gonna go a long way uh, in improving our, our system as a whole. So thank, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any questions from uh, JRAC members for either Steve or Sheriff Clark? So he hearing none, I would then ask for a report out uh, from Christine Blessinger on behalf of the Indiana Department of Corrections. Hello, Chris. Hello, thank you. Chris Blessinger, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Reentry and Youth Services for the Department of Correction. So I thought I would go ahead and uh, give you guys an update on where we were as far as COVID vaccines and, um, you know, so kind of that we're back to no pretty much normal programming in our facilities. Um, you know, it's, it's, we're still being careful and cautious, but it's, it's good to get, you know, all of the regular programming really up and running as normal. Um, so vaccine wise, we've, we've given about uh, 5,000, 
a, a little over 5,300 for the first vaccine, second vaccine doses, um, over 2,000. So uh, as far as total doses administered, we administered about 7,750, and that was the end of last week. So offenders are starting, you know, we're really ramping that up. And so this week, I'm sure those numbers have really increased. Um, so, and then also for, I thought I would give an update too, just for the next uh, six months from July to December for the community corrections grants. Um, we're, you know, we're doing a continuation of those grants for, for, those six, for that six months, that second part of the six months of the year. And uh, the award letters will be going out uh, probably pretty soon on that. So just kind of give everyone an update on there. Um, and really lastly, just looking forward to the committee to talk about community corrections and changes and suggestions and recommendations. And so um, I wanna take the opportunity to thank everybody who volunteered to be a part of it. Really looking forward to working with everyone. So thank you. Yeah, Chris, thank you. Um, are there any questions for Chris from JRAC members? Well, uh, Chris, thank you so much uh, for keeping our justice stakeholders and the courts in particular apprised of the important work the DOC has been doing in this incredibly uh, challenging time. So uh, I, I echo your appreciation to the members who are going to participate in the work group, and I thank you for your, uh, your leadership in, in getting the discussion started. Thank you. Uh, I'd next call for a report out on behalf of the Indiana Office of Judicial Administration from uh, Mary Kay Hudson. Thank you, Justice Goff. Um, I'm Mary Kay Hudson. I'm the Executive Director for the Indiana Office of Court Services, and I'm the designee of Justin Forkner, who is our Chief Administrative Officer. Um, to, just to uh, restate, um, our office uh, did participate in the Sheriff's Association meeting earlier this week. We thank Steve and Sheriff Clark for inviting us to, pre uh, to present on the jail management system project. Um, it was me and Donna Edgar from our Office of Court Technology, um, just providing an update to the sheriffs on the status of that project. Um, just to, to remind you of that, um, our Office of Court Talk Technology received a grant for the purposes of improving criminal history information, um, which will include building a jail management system that connects with all of our various systems so that we can be sure that um, all the proper information is connected in reporting criminal history information. Um, <clears throat> I think we, we had, it, what really wasn't until that presentation, uh, Donna presented on the tech side of things that I got a full understanding of what we can do and the power of data if we're able to connect all of our existing systems through the Office of Court Technology and possibly even um, PCMS and other data sets to improve uh, the sharing of data on criminal history and other information. Um, I think the sheriffs, I think it was well received. Uh, we do have five counties, um, sheriff offices who are participating in developing this project right now. Um, it includes Sheriff Clark and his jail commander, Captain Morgan in Hendricks County. Uh, we also have Vigo, Du Bois, Grant and Howard counties participating. Um, and then Donna also encouraged other sheriff's offices who wanted to join the discussion um, to be a part of that work group. The plan is to have the first phase of the first module of the project in testing uh, by the end of the year. So the project is moving forward and we cannot um, express how grateful we are for the participation and the responsiveness of those five counties. Um, it's just been really great. And I know, I know that court technology is thrilled to have uh, that partnership. Um, in terms of the Office of Court Services, um, our staff is, like everyone else, eager to get back in the field with our JDAI teams and our Justice Certification, our Justice Services Certification teams. Um, our problem-solving court numbers continue to grow. Our pretrial services programs continue to grow. Um, and then we also have our Justice Services Conference scheduled for next week. Um, I believe we did extend an invitation to our state partner agencies to distribute our registration link uh, for that conference. Um, I think we sent it out to uh, at least community corrections and PDs and prosecutors. Um, if you did not receive it, please reach out to uh, April or Angie Hensley and she can send that to you. Sheriffs are also welcome. Be uh, behavioral health providers are welcome to attend. Uh, we have a, a great conference scheduled for next week. <clears throat> Um, in terms of 
funding and grants. Um, our office was, like everyone else, pleased to see that our uh, budget appropriations for some of their criminal justice initiatives were sustained. Um, we do receive a direct appropriation from the General Assembly to support veterans treatment courts. Um, and then we also have funding through our office uh, and through the Supreme Court's budgets that provide some support to problem solving courts. And then the governor's office uh, through Doug uh, also allocated to us additional or continued funding for family recovery courts. Um, our office is in the process of, re of we've, we have uh, solicited grant applications for all of those funds. We are reviewing them right now. Um, and consistent with the JRAC statutes, we're gonna be presenting that information to JRAC for your review, just so that you have a sense for what funding is coming through our office for these local criminal justice initiatives. Um, Angie Hensley and Kristen Bonschbach have worked together very closely to ensure that our funding complements DOC's community correction funding. We have a lot of local programs who use blended funding sources from DOC and from the, uh, our funds. Um, so we just like to be sure that those are used as efficiently as possible. And then I can thank Angie for her efforts to uh, work with our fiscal office to see about transitioning our grant cycle to a calendar year that better matches uh, what the locals are working with with their local county budgets. So hopefully we'll be able to transition to that uh, for next year in 2022. And I think Justice Goff, that's all that I have to report. Mary Kay, uh, thank you very much for that very uh, thorough report. Are, are there any questions uh, for members of JRAC for Mary Kay? Right, well, well, hearing none, uh, th thank you so much for your uh, leadership on behalf of the courts and the, the justice system as a whole, Mary Kay. Um, next, ask them for a report out from Devin McDonald on behalf of the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute. Thank you, Justice Goff. Again, my name is Devin McDonald. I'm the executive director at the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute. Um, I don't really have much, um, uh, much to offer. I mentioned the law enforcement training grant earlier. Um, the one thing I would like to mention is kind of piggyback off what uh, Steve Luce mentioned with the data transformation project. So uh, CJI has been involved with that project along with, with Steve and ISA and DOC for uh, a couple years now. So it's, it's great to see that project finally uh, coming to fruition. Um, kind of the big news from the CJI standpoint is um, we will actually be taking the data ownership um, role within that project moving forward. Um, so that's uh, it's a pretty big uh, step for us, um, but it's also, you know, kind of self-serving uh, with us and being able to access the all of the criminal justice data like that at kind of any point in time that we need to. So it'll be pretty valuable when it comes to writing reports or providing data for uh, groups such as JRAC or, or EBDM or, or anything else. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, obviously, it's gonna, there's some other steps and pieces that need to be put in place for us to really take that ownership um, piece uh, and, and roll with that, but uh, we'll, we'll get that stuff in place and get moving forward. And so, like I said, we're really looking forward to, to that position and having access to that data moving forward. Devin, uh, I certainly agree. It's exciting to think about um, what, what that's going to mean uh, as that project comes online. Uh, are there any questions for Devin? Devin, thank you for your uh, continued leadership and, and partnership with the courts. We really appreciate your service and thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, and last but certainly not least, I would ask for a report out from Amber Finnegan uh, on behalf of the Association of Community Corrections Act Counties. Thank you, Justice. I'm Amber Finnegan. I'm the president of IACAC. I'm also the court services director down in Madison, Indiana and Jefferson County. Um, our spring conference for ICAC directors is going to be um, May the 12th through the 14th in French Lick, and um, it is going to be in person, and we are super excited to see each other. Um, a lot of us have grown up together, and, <laughs> and, um, we, and we've missed each other, so we're really looking forward to um, being able to relax and spend some good networking time together. Um, what we've been doing over the last few months is really just uh, keeping a close watch on um, 
House Bill 1068, um, making sure our memberships are aware of it, um, keeping up on through the legislative process of it. And we've really been encouraging our directors to start having conversations with their stakeholders about this as to how it may look in each in each one of their counties as um, there is a thing in there where it says that the local community correction advisory board may serve as um, the local JRAC. So um, we've put that out there. Uh, most of our members, well, they, they've all been notified of it. So hopefully they have been following that and have started those discussions. So we're really gonna use the spring conference as an opportunity for directors to come together and to talk about it and to problem solve and network and gather ideas. Um, it's always been a really beneficial conference um, just for those networking things where, where a lot of us learn, learn the most through those. Um, so other than that, we have been um, keeping uh, folks aware of, of the, the criminal code and, and any issues that they have had locally, um, just so we can try to address those when, when, the, when this is in review. Um, I think right now it, it's just, uh, you know, change is scary. And, and so, um, you know, we're just trying to, to over communicate everything we can to try to keep people, you know, um, informed of what's going on in that kind of thing. So I guess we will see how, where this goes um, and how it impacts community corrections at the local level. Um, other than that, uh, I, I believe that's all we have to read that I have to report on. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Uh, are there any questions from uh, members of JRAC for Amber? Amber, how many counties participate in community corrections? Is everyone, or what's the number? Um, some of them are some of them are regional. I want I want to say that there's like community corrections since some are regional, like 88, 89. I, I don't yeah, know. There's eighty nine. There's eighty nine. Amber. Yeah. yeah. Well, Amber, uh, thank you for your service, and uh, I really look forward to working with you uh, and. Uh, and, and look forward to uh, having this conversation going forward in the months to come. So uh, is there any other business uh, from members to, to bring before JRAC? Well, I'm hearing none. And so at this time, I'm going to inform uh, our members that the next meeting of JRAC is scheduled for Friday, June the 4th. It will be from 1 to 3 p.m., we plan to conduct that meeting via Zoom and an invitation for the meeting uh, has been forwarded to members. If health conditions permit, we will look toward having the remainder of our 2021 council meetings in person. So I know we're all uh, looking forward to that. And um, at this time, I, I just wanna con convey my appreciation to each of you uh, for participating in today's meeting and for all you do uh, to serve uh, Indiana. So thank you very much and have a great weekend. We're adjourned. Thanks, Justice. Bye, thank everybody. you.